Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Eleanor Landwehr. Eleanor earned her bachelor's in chemical and biological engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, during which time she performed undergraduate research in the Shoemaker Group. She has also done an internship at Merck in process chemistry. To pursue her doctorate, she came to Scripps, where she's currently a PhD student in the Shenvi Lab. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Eleanor. Thank you very much for coming on today. Hi, Matt. Thanks for the intro, and thank you for having me today on Synthesis Workshop. I'm super excited to be discussing the concise syntheses of GB22, GB13, and hemgolene by cross-coupling and complete reduction. 40 GB alkaloids have been isolated from the bark of GB trees in the rainforests of northern Australia and New Guinea. These alkaloids are divided into four classes based on their connectivity, and the ones I will be discussing today are all members of class 3. The GB alkaloids have interesting bioactivity. Historically, GB bark has been ingested by people indigenous to these areas for its antipyretic, analgesic, and psychotropic activity. GB alkaloids are able to penetrate the central nervous system with no acute toxicity. Additionally, they are orally bioavailable. Chewing a gram of GB bark, which would contain less than 5 milligrams of GB alkaloids, resulted in agitation, excitement, and hallucination. More specifically, within the class 3 GB alkaloids, hemgolene and hembidine, an N-methylated derivative of GB13, exhibited potent antispasmodic activity in rabbit intestines. With these syntheses, we set out to access material in order to identify relationships between structure and function, in the hopes of eventually identifying targets of each of the GB alkaloids. This would help us to hopefully determine which alkaloid or alkaloids are responsible for the effects brought on by ingesting GB bark. Taking a look at the retrosynthesis for GB22, we first install a methyl via reductive amination, which is preceded by demethylation to reveal the anisole. The piperidine could arise from pyridine hydrogenation, which would take us retrosynthetically back to the pyridine. This hydrogenation should be entirely diastereoselective due to the fact that all of the hydrogens would prefer delivery from the convex face of the molecule. This pyridine could be accessed through a friedel crafts reaction of nucleophilic attack by the electron-rich arrow ring into the ketone. This brings us back to a beta-substituted ketone, which we would go on to access via radical cross-coupling. There are two main focal points of this retrosynthetic analysis. First, we would need to develop a strategy to access this beta-substituted ketone, which cannot be accessed via typical microaddition strategies. Second, this strategy takes us from high fraction sp2 carbons to high fraction sp3. While I already previously mentioned that this would be easier for GB22, as all of the installed hydrogens would prefer attack from the convex phase, this strategy would be trickier to employ on GB13 and hemgolene, where multiple hydrogens would have to be installed on the concave phase. Nevertheless, this strategy would greatly reduce the synthetic burden. Let's start with the problems associated with accessing a structure like this one shown. Unfortunately, the enone required for a Michael addition would prefer the aromatic tautomer, which rules out that strategy. There was literature precedent for a friedel crafts on a similar system. However, these strongly acidic conditions failed for our system. With our options running out for two electron processes, we decided to start considering radical disconnections. After establishing the need for a radical disconnection, we had to think about how we would actually generate a radical beta to a ketone. In 2006, Matei showed that photo-induced single electron transfer triggered endocyclic ring opening of the siloxycyclopropane shown, which then underwent Giza addition in 66% yield. With palladium-catalyzed systems, cyclopropanes undergo exocyclic ring opening in order to minimize steric clash. However, with this photo-induced single electron transfer, we imagined being able to access the contrasteric product, which could then be intercepted with nickel to forge our desired sp3-sp2 bond. With a few more details of this key step fleshed out, we established a brief retrosynthesis to access our acquired pyridine siloxycyclopropane, and we're excited to see that the starting material was commercial or one step from commercial. We also identified our desired coupling partner as this easily accessible aryl bromide and had a general idea of what reagents to use to begin screening and optimization. While extensive screening was done to reach our final conditions, I've chosen a few key data points to highlight here. There are a lot more details in the supplementary materials if you're interested. Some key highlights from the optimization of this reaction are that 3CZCLIPN, the organo dye showed here, works better than iridium. 
This is exciting not just because of the increase in yield, but because the substituents on the cyanobenzene can be easily modified to impact the dye's oxidation potential. And if you're curious about this, you could refer to the JAX paper that I have referenced below. Additionally, these dyes are easy to make in multigram quantities, and they're less expensive than their iridium counterparts. Screening also identified the importance of a homogeneous base, and switching from potassium phosphate to pyridine bases greatly improved the yield. Also crucial to the reaction success was the setup. These reactions required rigorous degassing and were not able to be monitored by TLC due to even small amounts of air exposure shutting the reaction down. Our original conditions used a setup like the picture shown in the middle, where the light is held next to the reactions and a fan is used to control the temperature. However, this led to inconsistent cooling and variable light distribution from reaction to reaction, which we believe negatively impacted reproducibility, resulting in highly variable yields. Switching to the setup seen on the far right improved reproducibility and allowed for temperature control via water bath. The red plastic reaction holder was 3D printed and gifted to us by the Dewey Lab, which we're super grateful for because it allowed us to set up six reactions with almost identical environments in terms of temperature and light exposure. Now that we had a reaction that was both high yielding and reproducible, it was time to revisit the synthesis substrates. Unfortunately, we did still have a major problem in that the required pyridine siloxycyclopropane was extremely difficult to access. While we were initially excited that the pyridine we needed was commercial or just one step from commercial, it turned out that the one step from commercial was far from perfect. The initial route to access the pyridine siloxycyclopropane began with the condensation reaction combining methyl vinyl ketone, ammonium acetate, and cyclopentane dione. Although the product of this reaction is technically commercial, it was cheaper to make it ourselves. In our hands, however, this reaction only gave 10 to 20% yield of product contaminated with a minor regioisomer, which made purification difficult. After this condensation reaction was siloenyl ether synthesis by TMS triflate and triethylamine, followed by the Xi modification of the Simmons Smith reaction. It was difficult to get gram quantities of the required pyridine with this method. In contrast, we developed an alternative strategy commencing with Suzuki cross-coupling of owl B pin onto the chloropyridine shown. This methyl ester is technically commercial and is cheap enough that we could have bought it, although we chose to methylate the related carboxylic acid, which is only $2 per gram. After this, Kalinkovich cyclopropanation yields the cyclopropanol, which is quantitatively silylated to the corresponding TMS cyclopropane. We were pleased to find that the method optimized for the general substrate yielded 23% of the desired cross-coupled product for our syntheses, but we knew we had to optimize further. While we were developing the Suzuki and Kalinkovich route, we actually identified a model system to help us when material was precious. This model system helped us determine the importance of concentration and reaction yield. We also discovered that one of the material losses was the aryl bromide converting to aryl chloride, presumably through reductive elimination with the chloride from the catalyst. Once we moved away from nickel chloride, we identified nickel bromide as a competent catalyst, and through further optimization, we were able to boost the yield to 57% isolated. More details on the optimization can be found in the supplementary materials, but in the interest of time, I won't be going through them. One big switch we did make was switching from 3CZ CLIPN to 4CZ IPN, a less oxidizing photocatalyst. With a fully optimized method, we could complete the substrate scope, which shows the applicability and generality of the method for a variety of substrates. For all of the substrates shown, conjugate addition strategies would fail due to the required enone preferring the aromatic tautomer. The ratios shown refer to the presence of a minor regioisomer that for the more nonpolar substrates was extremely difficult to remove. The minor regioisomer results from the primary radical product of exocyclic cyclopropane ring opening. Luckily for our more polar synthesis substrate, column chromatography was enough to remove the minor regioisomer, so it wasn't an issue in the synthesis. With the photochem step working well, it was time to move forward to the Friedel crafts. This work was done almost exclusively by Dr. Takuya Oguma, and it was his thoughtful optimization that revealed HFIP and diethyl aluminum chloride as the magic combination necessary for this reaction to work well. Originally, the O-benzyl protected alcohol was used for optimization. However, once the O-methyl group was investigated and it outperformed the O-benzyl group, we switched to using the O-methyl almost exclusively, even for access to GB22. 
Treatment with strong acid like triflic acid destroyed the bond we had just spent carefully optimizing conditions to form. While almost none of this decomposition material was detected from the HFIP diethyl aluminum chloride conditions. With the photochem and Friedel crafts optimized, we proceeded with a pyridine hydrogenation protocol developed by the Sarpong lab and their synthesis of GB13 from 2009. The remaining two steps of the route are simple and high yielding. Demethylate the anisole and methylate the secondary amine via reductive amination. With that, we have a six to eight step synthesis of racemic GB22, depending on which pyridine synthesis route you use and what you consider commercial. Now, we were kind of at a crossroads because we had accomplished everything that we had originally set out to do. We had accessed GB22 and we had developed a strategy for SP3, SP2 cross coupling of aerobromides and siloxycyclopropanes. But at the same time, we saw how close we were to GB13 and hemgaline. And with encouragement from Ryan Chenvi and Megan Baker, we continued our journey into GB alkaloid chemical space. The route to GB13 and hemgaline proceeds through the same pyridine hydrogenation product as that of GB22. From this common intermediate, we require a birch reduction followed by a hydrolysis to access GB13, which is just one reduction away from hemgaline. Early screening by Megan Baker identified methylamine as the most proficient solvent, making this technically not a birch reduction, but a Benkiser reduction, as it uses an alkylamine as the solvent rather than ammonia. We did try standard ammonia birch conditions, however, we mostly recovered starting material with minimal, if any, conversion to desired product. We worked to develop a protocol for this Benkiser reduction. However, it was always difficult to quantify exactly how much lithium we used. We tried to use as small lithium chunks as we could cut, and we added them throughout the course of the reaction with careful monitoring by LCMS, as we wanted to minimize formation of the phenol in an over-reduced byproduct. Here you can see the distribution of products and byproducts by LCMS. Unfortunately, with these conditions, we almost never saw full conversion and were always able to recover some starting material. That being said, these conditions did work well enough to obtain material and moderate yield. Luckily, conditions for an ammonia-free birch were published in Science in 2021, and it couldn't have come at a better time because I was really starting to relate to Walter and Jesse trying to find new methylamine sources after our lecture bottle ran out. I had finally resorted to freebasing it from the methylamine HCl salt and sodium hydroxide, which worked just as well as the lecture bottle but was more time-consuming and required a more elaborate reaction setup. With this new report, just a few drops of ethylene diamine and terp-butanol in THF was required. This new method, while also keeping me from breaking bad, went to full conversion consistently and did not require addition of small chunks of lithium over many hours. It worked quickly, completely, and consistently within one to two hours after adding lithium. Hydrolysis could hypothetically take place following the reduction more as a workup than a separate reaction or step, and this is actually how we accessed a lot of our initial GB13 samples. However, they were all contaminated with the overreduced byproduct that was difficult to remove even after extensive solvent screening for purification. Because of this, in order to access pure GB13, we chose to isolate and purify the enol ether and then hydrolyze in a separate step. For the synthesis of hemgaline, however, we were able to hydrolyze the enol ether without isolating it, because hemgaline is much more easily separated from the overreduced byproduct. One lingering question we had is why is the desired diastereomer the one that we obtain? We believe that the stereoselectivity favors the trans ring fusion, even though that is a higher energy confirmation than the cis ring junction of GB13, because the acidic conditions promote the Aza Michael reaction and cause the hydrolysis to proceed through the intermediacy of 16 oxohemgaline, which prefers the trans ring junction. This means two hydrogens are delivered on the concave face, while only one is delivered to the convex face in the final reduction hydrolysis sequence. To summarize the final route from start to finish, we were able to start with high fraction sp2 molecules and access completely reduced hemgaline via novel metallophotoredox mediated sp2 sp3 cross coupling, Friedel crafts, pyridine hydrogenation, Benkiser reduction, and finally directed reduction, as established by a previous synthesis of hemgaline. With this route, we have quick access to hemgaline, but also to intermediates and analogs close to it in chemical space, allowing for biological investigations to connect structure and function of these alkaloids. We have also been able to separate the enantiomers by SFC for further biological testing.
And with that, I would like to thank everyone who worked on this paper, Dr. Megan Baker, Dr. Takuya Oguma, Hannah Burge, and Takahiro Kawajiri, and of course, Professor Ryan Shenby. I'm so grateful to have been a part of this team. I especially owe a huge thanks to Megan, who helped me so much in my first year of graduate school. I would also like to thank the other labs at Scripps and my colleagues and friends in those labs for always lending a helping hand, whether it was sharing chemicals or ideas. Thanks so much, Matt, for hosting me. This has been so fun. Anyone who made it through to the end, thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thanks again. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode. And thank you to Eleanor for joining us to share your work. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast. And feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date and see you all next time.